I just want to do God's will. What you're seeking is a blessing from God. You must expect a miracle. You have the power of choice. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Life Today Live. It is Friday, and this is going to be a fun program. I, you know, for years, um, quite a while, you, you have probably heard point of view radio, whether it's the short form or the long version, over 300 stations nationwide. Point of view has been hitting current uh, events and issues uh, and, and being, and not everybody's done this, but they have also stayed true to biblical principles, and I really appreciate that. Kirby Anderson is the guy that you hear and he's with me today, and I'm pretty excited. We can talk about anything. By the way, chat is open. If you are watching us live, uh, you can pop in the chat, throw your question in the ring, and you never know. We might just we can go anywhere we want today. But there is a recent survey, uh, and it was featured in recently in uh, the Christian Post and some other outlets, and it looks like this. And what it is doing is talking about what's going on with the younger generation right now. There it is. Um, and, you know, this is a thing that, you know, it affects all of us, you know, future generations, the future of the church, of the nation. Uh, and there's some things, interesting things going on, but they are addressable. And that's what I want you to take away today, how you can have an impact on the younger generations. But Kirby Anderson, great to have you here on Life Today Live. Randy, great to be with you and looking forward to getting into some of these issues. All right. Well, so let's start with that survey. Talk us through what you guys looked for and what you found. You know, people that might be familiar with Pro Ministries, we've been around since 1973, so some people might know who we are, um, actually has always been kind of a worldview apologetics ministry. But 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, we began to say, you know, there seems to be a very significant decline in young people in terms of what they believe. So 10 years ago, the 2010 survey actually looked primarily at what we call today the millennial generation, those born after 1980. And we were looking primarily then just at born again millennials. Uh, but now more recently, we've done this new survey, which came out this last year, the 2020 survey that looked at not only the generation Y, millennials, but generation Z. And first of all, it gave us a chance to do some comparison because this one now over 3000 individuals surveyed. So it helped us not only look at what is happening inside the church, but is happening outside the church. And most importantly, Randy, one of the other things we really want to focus on is what is happening with what we call the unaffiliated mm -hmm. that uh, sometimes are referred to as the nuns, the people that when they do a survey, say atheist, agnostic or no preference, they have no political or even religious preference, primarily, of course, religious or even church preference or religious preference. But it is kind of intriguing to look at that as well. So this was an attempt to try to pull a lot of those numbers together to really do some comparisons and to be maybe begin to answer some of the questions and maybe counter some of the myths that we've been hearing for many years. Do you do you think that um, is, is this generational sort of thing uh, cyclical, you know, do because you know you saw it in the '60s, and whether they say it or not, it seems like when kids hit, you know, a, early adulthood, a lot of times they're searching, they're looking, they don't necessarily want to be pigeonholed, and so they don't really want to identify. Uh, but you know, a lot of people raise up that child in the way they wish to go. When they're older, <laughs> when they're old, they don't depart from it. it. Is has there been a really seismic shift, or is this sort of the way it tends to be? And that is uh, one of the key questions we wanted to try to ask and answer, because we've heard people say, look, at the age of 18, when a young person graduates from high school, he or she then goes off to college, goes in the military, goes in the workforce, and almost without exception, they take a break from church. And so we understand that. But the argument has always been, well, yeah, but they'll be like the swallows to Capistrano. They'll come back to Capistrano once again. In other words, once they get married, they have children, they'll come back to church. And so that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And have we been able to do that? We found now when we do a comparison of the last 10 years that not only are they not coming back, a greater percentage of them are unaffiliated. Now, that leads to some people saying, well, you know, recognize when they're unaffiliated, it's quite possible that they might actually be born again Christians. They might actually have orthodox views, 
but they can't find a Bible teaching church. And I spend a fair amount of my time both in the Northeast and the Northwest every single year. Those are not as religious as the Midwest and the South. Mm -hmm. So is that a possibility? Well, it's a theoretical possibility. But again, when you do this survey and deeply go into it, you realize that those individuals that are unaffiliated, obviously they don't go to church. But also when you ask them other questions about um, how often do you read the Bible, how often do you ever pray, you recognize that they're not orthodox as well. Hmm. So it has always been the case up until fairly recently that you had a generation that sometimes disengages from the church for a while, but then they come back again. But this idea that they're going to return to church is based upon a false assumption. Hmm. You know the old movie theater uh, phrase, if you build it, they will come. Right. Well, we built 350,000 churches. They're not coming. Now, I'm going to come back in just a few minutes to talk about what we can do to help reach out to those. But the harsh reality is, in most cases, they're not coming back to church. One, because they're unaffiliating. Two, let's also recognize, Randy, that when we talk about coming back to church, that presupposes that they were in church in the first place. Mm. And this is a generation that's much more uh, non-churched or unchurched. A good example of that is I live in Dallas, and one of my friends teaches at the Dallas Art Institute, and she will lots of times take them into art galleries to look at art. She also teaches architecture, so she'll take them into various buildings. And when they walk into a church, it's amazing. Usually a majority of the kids say, this is the first time I've ever been in a church. Oh, wow. Now think about that. That means they didn't go to vacation Bible school. That means they may have never been to a church wedding, may never have been to a funeral in a church. And so when you talk about coming back to church, they may not have been church in the first place. And so if we're thinking about this, this idea that, well, these individuals are going to come in the back door of your church, they're going to come in the foyer and look around and say, I really want to know more about this. That's probably not going to happen, but I think there are ways, and there should be ways, that we can reach out to the next generation. Well, yeah, and I think that's that's a $100 million question right there, is how, how do we reach a generation that's not being brought up in the church? Well, and I think the answer is what we're doing right now. There are a lot of people, to be perfectly honest, they probably will not come in the doors of your church, but they may watch this program right now. They may uh, go to an online church service. I've had everybody from Jack Graham to Greg Laurie say, we actually have many more people watching yeah. because of the pandemic and the lockdown. Yeah. But also it requires not just the technology, it requires the connection. If you were to ask right now, Randy, who in our audience or those that they know are struggling with anxiety, maybe drug abuse, uh, loneliness, or a variety of others, they would all know examples of individuals who are not going to church, who are feeling those kinds of pressure, pressures and trends and concerns and um, maybe even pathologies. And so they are, in a sense, in a position of need. But even though they have that need, it doesn't really occur to them to go to church to right. have that need met. Right. So it's going to be key for pastors, Sunday school leaders, and others with maybe outreaches in the media, small group outreaches, a variety of other kind of evangelistic outreaches to show that there's a connection there. And more importantly, it gets down to some key buzzwords. And I hate to use them, but it's really true. For the average of millennial or iGen generation, generation Y, generation Z, it isn't that they are really hostile to Christianity, although there are some that have read Richard Dawkins or Daniel Dennett or Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens, and you know they're really feist fighting against Christianity. Yeah. Most of them are not. They're just really apathetic about it. They don't sense that the Bible, they don't sense that the church, they don't sense that Christianity has any relevance to their lives. So as a result, what we have to do is make the connection. So words like relevant, I want to see, and I want to know whether or not the Bible is even relevant to my life mm. in one way. Uh, the other key buzzword is authenticity. I know these are words overused, misused, and all that, but they want to know, are you authentic? You know, are, are you just trying to sell me something? You know, are you really caring about me? It's the old, I don't care what you know, I just first to need know that you care. Yeah. And so I think those are key aspects if we're going to begin to turn this around 
in the 21st century that we're going to have to do not only inside the institutional church, but in the broader body of Christ as we reach out to our friends, neighbors, and coworkers. It's the old secret to success, find a need and fill it. And Lord knows there's plenty of emotional and spiritual need in people right now. So it's just uh, as simple, I think, sometimes as, as trying to fill it. And we know the answer. Uh, the, the ultimate fulfillment is in Christ. What you? What are your thoughts on those who are Christians or call themselves Christians? I, I don't sit here on, in a judgment seat, but they they don't hold to Christian principles. You know, um, they we we call it compromise. They call it progressivism sometimes. But they say, okay, you know. Uh, well, maybe homosexuality isn't so bad. You know, God loves everybody, right? Well, yeah, sure he does. But how do you—to me, I, I would almost rather deal with someone who's hostile to Christianity or completely apathetic rather than someone who is wrapped up in Christianity but not holding to the Scripture, you know? Um, what? Do, how much of that is watering down what we're trying to do? Well, again, that's a good question, and that's one that over the next couple of months, we're going to be releasing different parts of the survey, but I'll give you kind of a preview of coming attractions, because first of all, some of this was done 10 years ago. In our 2010 survey, we were looking primarily at born-again Christians. Now, if you're born again, what does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, that you've had a um, conversion experience that was meaningful at the time and still meaningful to you today. Number two, that you believe that you're saved by grace. So when we were looking back then uh, at hundreds and hundreds of born-again millennials, we found something very interesting, Randy, and they broke down into almost perfect one-thirds. Hmm. One-third have a biblical worldview and attend church. One-third did not have a biblical worldview, but did attend church. And by attending church, we meant two out of every four Sundays. So it's not a high bar to hit. And then one-third did not have a biblical worldview and did not attend church. So then even if you start looking at those individuals that have a biblical worldview, they believe in kind of the basic essentials about God and Jesus Christ and salvation, those kinds of things. As you then go further down and ask other questions about gender, sexual orientation and the rest, it begins to narrow, narrow very quickly down to fractions, you know, a couple percentage points. Uh, I won't get into all the numbers. The same kind of thing is happening now. And so what we have found is the same thing that George Barna has found. George Barna has been on my program a lot of times. The most prominent worldview in America today is what we call syncretism. That's a big word for saying it's kind of cafeteria philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, you go through a cafeteria, you get your jello and you get your um, salad and you get your entree and you get your dessert. And sometimes when you get to your table, you go, what have I done to myself? But that's kind of what people are doing. You know, I got some ideas that I've picked up from the Bible or from coming to church. I got some ideas that I've picked up from Oprah Winfrey. I got some other ideas that I've heard people talk about on social media. And the disproportionately large number of individuals have kind of a syncretistic worldview. And that's true not only of those who are not born again, it's sadly true of a very high percentage, especially of the younger generation that are born again. So they're saved in their heart, but they're not saved in their head. In other words, they may be saved, they may indeed be going to heaven, they may indeed try to actually say that they're living out the Christian life, but they've adopted false ideas from the culture. Yeah. And so a key verse for that would be Colossians 2.8, where here Paul warns even those in the first century, and if it was true in the first century, it's true at, for sure in the 21st century, of the fact that people have become captive to the culture. Yep. And so we call these people culturally captive Christians. They may be saved in the church, but they may not be thinking biblically. And so there's another application point for a pastor, a Sunday school leader listening right now. Do not assume that uh, when you are teaching from the pulpit or you're teaching in a Sunday school class, that everybody in that particular group, either in your congregation or in your Sunday school class, necessarily have an orthodox worldview. Because Randy, we've also been able to test that out as well. Uh, we have done some surveys, and I'll just pick one, which is not far from where you are, in Cleburne, Texas. And we did an entire survey of the church. 
and um, evaluated how orthodox their views were. Now, to be fair, the pastor there is a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. So we've got to say he was probably teaching good teaching, mm -hmm. but he was shocked and we were shocked at the number of people that did not have what we would consider to be a biblical worldview. Now, to be fair to him, there was a tornado that had come through the town and there were a lot of people that had been in a Methodist church that was destroyed that came into his church. But the point is, <laughs> just because you're teaching it biblically from the pulpit, doesn't necessarily mean that it's being received. And so I'll give him half credit by saying, you know, he may have been doing good teaching, but people aren't listening. And you know, as well as I do, communication comes from the speaker to the listener. And so just because you are teaching it from the pulpit doesn't necessarily mean that they're always receiving it. But I think sometimes we assume that our congregations, we assume the people we're interacting with hold to a biblical worldview, and yet I can prove through all the surveys, especially the ones we will have coming out and some of the research we'll be having coming out in the next couple of months, that no, they don't. They mm -hmm. might, in some respects, give you some superficial answers that sound like they are orthodox in their view, but they really aren't. Right. So that's another really kind of action point for pastors today. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting because Cleburne's a very conservative area of a conservative state overall in Texas. It's not like Austin or something. But uh, and I, I got married in a Methodist church, so we got we got to be nice to the Methodists. No, and I mean, um, <laughs> the reality was is that that was not a church that was a Bible church. And so here, a good illustration. And again, that's some of the things we found out. We break these down into terms: what you find in the mainline Protestant churches, what you find in the Catholic churches, what you find in what are called evangelical churches. And um, we're also finding that um, there are some real surprises in all of that. You sometimes make some assumptions that are not necessarily accurate, and we're able to prove some of that. And, and you know, and where the where the rubber meets the road on that, it, it, when someone is, um, you know, in that state where they're they're heavily influenced by the culture, more so or equally so than, than by the word of God. What 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 happens to people in your opinion? In my in my view, I just see okay, it makes them one ineffective in the culture, you know, uh, they're not really that liked that they should be. But number two, it seems like it really sets them up for disappointment, for frustration. It's it's that lack of integrity, and, and by integrity, I mean wholeness. Uh, you know, if, if we're fractured, man, when when difficult times hit or when, when we're tested, it just seems like we're, if we're built on that sand, it's just, it's just gonna, things are going to fall apart for those people. And is that what you see? Or do you, have you looked that far down the road? Yeah, we have. Because uh, again, what you find is that uh, if you ask certain questions that sort of put you into the category of, are, are you missing something? Um, you will get um, with the non-Christian world, Sort of, you know, it, uh, again, there are some that'll say, oh, I'm doing fine, you know, and you know as well as I do, you'll meet people and I'm doing fine, I'm, you know, I'm good, you know, I don't need anything, and that's one of the reasons why sometimes they don't look at the church, they don't look at Christianity because they right. think they're fine, right. but you even sense sometimes with some of those that don't necessarily have a fulfilling experience with Jesus Christ, they also feel like there's something missing. And right. I think that illustrates why we have seen that the unaffiliated have gone from 13% to 35%. That is a three, almost a threefold increase in 10 years. So obviously they felt something was missing. And of course, the other question that probably comes, well, why? Why don't individuals get re-engaged with the Bible? And it isn't that they are necessarily not engaged. What we find are some of these individuals that do attend church, they still have non-Christian views about the world. And my quick answer to that, Randy, is simply social media. If you look at especially the younger generation, Generation Y, and especially even more so Generation Z, the first, if you will, digital natives, they are the first generation to have grown up and never had a time when there weren't iPads and iPhones and things like that. It used to be the Kaiser Family Foundation used to estimate about 10 hours of media input for those under the age of 18. That number is now getting closer to 15 hours. But whatever number you want to use, uh, let's pick a halfway between 12, 13 hours, 12 hours a day of media input over seven days. And I've got to counteract that with a one hour sermon. Guess who wins? And that, I think, illustrates why we have such a problem today with syncretism and why we have such a problem of people that are culturally captive. And why it's important that people uh, watch and share programs like this as well as Point of View. And I want to show 
uh, Kirby Anderson's website for Point of View. It's pointofview.net. And if you look right up there, if you're watching on the screen, you can see listen online, watch online, find a station in your area. And if you're not checking out Point of View, I would encourage you to do that and listen on the radio or do the digital thing uh, and, and share that. It's He's hitting topics every day that are important. And I want to do a little bit of a hard left turn here uh, because I didn't know this till I got the little bio on you, but you have a, a master's degree from Yale University in science, as well as a master's from Georgetown in government. Um, so that that puts you, I mean, you know, that puts you at a pretty good level uh, of authority, you know, at least in theory on the topics. I want to ask you about what's going on right now in our country with not just with the Delta variant, uh, which is to me looks like the the natural course of any virus, uh, where it attenuates, becomes less deadly, more uh, uh, spreadable, contagious. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, but our response to it with the vaccine is it a vaccine really? Uh, you know, or is it just a treatment shot? What I really want your take on what's going on in both the, the science and the government response to the COVID situation right now in our country. Well, and again, we've had on the program and people can do a search on there to uh, talk to some doctors and uh, one in particular helped us explain the fact. And I like the fact that you said that because when we call it a vaccine, it's very different. A typical vaccine, and uh, not only do I have a science background, but my father was working for Pfizer. My grandfather was a doctor, so we kind of come from sort of a <laughs> medical family as well. And a typical vaccine is where you take a, a virus and you disable it. It's attenuated and then you inject it. Well, this is a very different kind of treatment. It's called mRNA. What it does is it actually creates this little spike protein and then causes your body to react as if you have the virus. So there's no way you can get the virus because you're only reacting to the spike protein. So the good news is, is it probably uh, as uh, even less dangerous in that regard. Although now people are starting to say, yeah, but we're finding in autopsy sometimes that spike protein in every organ of the body. So what about that, you know? And more importantly, since it's not a vaccine, we're already talking about a third booster shot. You know, <laughs> when I got, uh, you know, polio vaccine, actually I'm old enough to remember I got out of a sugar cube, but you know, when we got the polio vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, you never get to get, need to get another one, right? And yet the reality is this is trying to get your immune system to react to it. And um, there is some evidence, and again, this is somewhat controversial, that natural immunity might even be better than artificial immunity. In other right. words, if you've got COVID-19, right. you might actually be more protected than getting the, vi the vaccine. And so again, the argument is, well, the vaccine will protect you. And the president the other day said, if you get the vaccine, you won't get the virus. Wrong. Right. You, know, you talk about misinformation. There's misinformation because as we'll be even talking about on the program today, you have people in Massachusetts after a gay pride parade that all sorts of people got the vaccine and all of uh, had the vaccine, but still got the virus anyway. So that's called breakthrough. So the reality is, is that this has been moving pretty quickly. Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson. There are some people wondering about the long-term effects, right. but more importantly, as uh, helpful as that has been maybe to have stopped some of the flow of it, it's not as effective as we were promised that it would be. And as you point out, with the latest Delta variant, that makes it more contagious. You can be around a person for a much shorter period of time and catch it but it also teams, seems to be a little less virulent. So the argument being made by those that are, especially Democrats or those who are convinced that this is a real crisis is we need another mask mandate. We need to have a vaccine mandate. We need to have more lockdowns and all the rest. But of course you get other answers from everybody from, I say Governor Ron DeSantis to Governor Greg Abbott saying, this is just gonna be with us for some time. But just as a footnote, since I'm kind of looking at science and history, can you think of any human disease that we've ever been able to eradicate? Yeah, no. Smallpox. Uh, Smallpox is it. Is Smallpox it? is the only one. Hmm. Here's a good example of the bacillus that killed so many people during the Black Death is still around and hmm. it still pops up every once in a while. So you just have to realize that when we are talking about this, if we're gonna really be honest, 
the reality is it's always probably going to be with us. We've always had the flu with us. We've always had the cold with us. We wish we could just eradicate this. And the goal of uh, China and uh, Australia and New Zealand just to lock it down so that we would n actually uh, completely eliminate the virus, how's that working for you? Well, it didn't work. And the, the sad reality is having a good immune system using what little we have with the MRA vaccines are helpful, but they aren't that silver bullet that we were being promised. And I think that's the fairest assessment of what's going on. So you, you don't have a problem with the vaccine itself, the mRNA vaccine? Well, I think there's some reasons that people have concerns about it. There are some people that are honestly allergic to that. So that would be the first obvious. Uh, that's only a few thousand of Americans. There are other people that are just saying, simply saying, look, I've had the virus. Um, I have natural immunity. Not sure I should take it. Mm. So I, I, you can start putting the categories out there. And of course, the argument being made right now by this president and even by the CDC director is that everybody should get the vaccine. Well, again, we haven't even approved it for the kids. And so there are just all sorts of categories that you can begin to say that box should not be checked if we're even going to be honest about that. And um, I have to say, even around our own studio, most people got the vaccine, but not everybody, you know, for all sorts of reasons. Do you have you have you run down the trail of the spike proteins? And because we don't know what the long term effects could be with, you know, with the capillary blockages and things like that. Right. And that is the big issue. I mean, we have sure uh, i think we're up to what 191 million that have had at least one dose so you sort of have this experiment going on right before yep. our very eyes right but the experiment has lasted for only months not years and mm -hmm. uh, we know, recognize that some of those questions need to be answered in the long term and when we were rushing this vaccine into production let's give uh credit to you know the trump administration and operations of uh, various uh, uh, attempts to, but uh, still the argument is that we don't know all of that and um, sadly we may find that out years from now and nobody right now can predict it nobody with scientific certainty can say anything more than um, it looks pretty good but uh, the death rate is still what you would expect for some of these kinds of foreign vaccines being put in your body and for people because of various uh, allergic reactions or comorbidities to die after they get the vaccine. Yeah. So you don't, you don't think that there's uh, computer chips in there and that it's the mark of the beast. <laughs> I did do, yes, I did do a program <laughs> on that, as you might imagine, uh, because we just thought that we would, and matter of fact, I, I actually had this one doctor, he's been on Fox news and he's actually a friend and everything. I just threw every one of these <laughs> right. questions at him that I could. And if you want to watch it or listen to it, it's on the website, point of Uh, then I had Curtis Chang who was talking about evangelicals yeah. have some vaccine hesitancy. So I gave him a chance to be, on there yeah. and then i've also tried to report the number of people that have died from taking the vaccine so i'm giving you all the information the kind of information that social media won't give you yeah. and most mainstream what? press won't give you what? you're what you're, you're trying to be balanced and informative what are you doing that's not the way know, it works today tough. yeah that's tough to find anymore isn't it no. well, so you're okay i i will say that you, in doing that you're you're being nice and even and balanced you're not you're not throwing any firebombs out here um but I'm going to try to get you to. So at what point should Americans and or Christians or both, however you want to cut that, stand up to the government and say, no, we're not doing what you're trying to get us to do? Yeah, I think we've already passed that point a long time ago. <laughs> okay. You know, when we start having these mandates that are irresponsible. And um, first of all, Randy, one of the things that I use even to make the case is that um, we have those individuals that say, practice what I say not what I do, you know, and again, you should practice what you preach, but the reality is, and I, whether we're looking at the governor of the state of California, whether we're looking at the mayor of Chicago, whether we're looking more recently, the mayor of Washington, DC and on and on and on, they all say that you are supposed to follow this particular edict in terms of not gathering together, uh, wearing a mask and all the rest. And we have so many stories that we've documented, I'm sure you have as well, of individuals that are saying, well, do what I say, but not what oh, yeah. I do. Oh, yeah. And that uh, I think is one of the great crises we have right now in the culture. And it's all the more reason for us to say, enough is enough. Yeah. Uh, we're, this is gonna be with us for some time. Uh, we're gonna have to live with COVID-19, just like we've had to live with every other bacillus every other kind of vaccine and virus. And we don't have time to talk about it, but they're also letting, uh, you know, people come across the border and shipping them out to every state in the United States. 
sometimes putting them on, on flight, getting free flights. I, I wouldn't mind a free flight uh, of, of people who are coming here, not through the legal means. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, we're in Texas, so it, it's part of the culture here. And I, and I love, you know, the well, most of the people that come across are, are some of the best people in the world, but they're not necessarily coming legally. And they're, a lot of them are bringing over diseases, Very not just COVID, but other things. Very high percentage of them testing positive for COVID. Very yeah. high percentage. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and if we were serious, if it was really as bad as they say, that wouldn't be allowed. So... I don't know. Well, we've run out of time. you got a radio show to do, so I'm going to let you get to that soon. And you're, you'll be talking about some of these issues and more. So if people want to, yeah. if you're watching live and you want to jump over to Point of View, they'll be gearing up in about half an hour here. Otherwise, check it out. Find out uh, where they're at. And Kirby Emerson, I appreciate what you do. I just, in, in today's yellow journalism culture that we've reverted back to with the advent of the Internet, I appreciate you at least bringing some balance from a Christian perspective and hitting all sides of the issue. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, and looking forward to another opportunity with you in the future. Absolutely, man. There's Lord knows there's enough topics. Appreciate you guys watching, uh, hanging through. I know we're having some, a little bit of lagging issues. That is uh, outside of our office here in this uh, area where we're at with AT&T. Hopefully they'll get that resolved over the weekend and we won't deal with that, but I will be posting this file, um, reposting this file, especially on light source. It's clean. It looks great on my end. It's just once it tries to get out of here, it's a little iffy yesterday and today. So we'll deal dealing with that, dealing with COVID and masks and uh, Gen Zers and all those things. We'll deal with it. Uh, and so come back next week. We've got a lot of great interviews. Uh, do check out pointofview.net on the radio, online, however you want to watch it. And keep up. Keep the hope alive. Uh, we're the light, so go be the light. Have a good week, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>